Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church on the third Sunday of Advent. Have a lot of announcements today, so a big thank you to Jim Johnson. Um, apparently our nativity set needed quite a lot of reassembly and fixing in order to be set up. So thank you, Jim, for taking care of that. Um, there are three items left for the community gift buying project. Um, that information is on the bulletin board, so if you feel like you can take an item today and contribute to that, um, please do that as our time is drawing a little bit short. Thank you to everyone who helped with the Mary and Martha cookie sale. That's always a project that's looked forward to. Um, if you are bringing in Christmas cards, please put those in the box in the vestry by December 22nd. Um, some of those cards need to be delivered to folks at home, um, and that will just give Lindy a little bit of time to get those cards out. So if you can get your cards in by December 22nd. Tonight, there will be a live stream of Christmas with the Chosen, the Messengers at 8 p.m. There's a link in your bulletin to go ahead and join the live stream. On Tuesday, there is a deacon meeting at 4.30 and a nominating committee meeting at 6. On Thursday, there is choir practice at 7 in the vestry. On Friday, there is a young adult supper and game night at the Salmon's home beginning at 6 p.m. On Saturday, there is a men's breakfast and embark meeting at 9 a.m. Happy birthday to Melissa Bushy on Tuesday. The flowers today are from the Salmon's family with joy for Christ's birth. Beginning next week, we will be displaying poinsettias. If you would like to purchase and dedicate one to a loved one, please send the dedication information to RebeccaSalmons at gmail.com. There are two opportunities to give a special offering this month. The first is the white envelopes in the pews that resupply the fuel fund for heating the church. And the mission offering for this month is the second one. This will be our last opportunity to give to create a sustainability project for our sister church in Kinihara, Rwanda. This will enable them to generate money for school fees for the children in need of their church family. You can use the envelopes in the front or mark your offering Rwanda on your check. No, this is not Jay, but Jeremy is filling in. <laughs> A little taller. A little taller. <laughs> Today we relight the first two candles of the Advent wreath, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. Now we light the third candle of Advent. This is the candle of joy. As the coming of Jesus, our Savior, draws nearer, our joy builds with our anticipation of his birth. From the book of Isaiah, we read the words of our Lord. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. From the New Testament, the words of Paul to the people of the church at Galatia. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us pray. We joyfully praise you, O Lord, for the fulfillment of your promise of a Savior and what that means in our lives. Thank you for the gift of salvation through the birth of your son, Jesus. Create us anew as we wait and help us to see your glory as you fill our lives with your living spirit. Amen.
call to worship is in, printed in your bulletin. It's from Luke 12, 35 to 40. If you would read the bold lines along with me. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will seek them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected.
to join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, this Advent, we've been tracing the theme of light through scripture. So we began by speaking our God speaking light into existence as a reflection of his glory at the dawn of creation. And then the magnificent stars that God also created became a sign of promise to Abraham when he was kind of discouraged and perhaps even doubting God's ability and timing and his love for him. And then moving forward in the story again of God and his people, we come to the time of Moses and Aaron and the promise fulfilled. There are so many descendants of Abraham that they're almost a nation and they're making their way from Egypt to the promised land. As they travel for 40 years through the wilderness, they're learning to trust God for direction, for protection, and for their daily bread, their provision. Manna was their daily bread, and the protection and the direction came as they followed a manifestation of God's presence that appeared as a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. And not only that big sign, but God also gave them very specific directions when he spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai for how to create a tabernacle that would help them know and worship God. And one of the items in this tabernacle was a golden lampstand. Did you know that the Hebrew word for lampstand is menorah? Maybe you did. I know some of you did. <laughs> So this morning, as we listen to the passages from Exodus and Leviticus, we'll have a chance to learn more about the significance of the menorah and see how it relates both to Hanukkah and to our own practice of lighting candles at this time of year. Our text is from Exodus 25, 31 to 40, and Leviticus 24, 1 to 4. Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold, Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece, the base, center stem, lamp cups, buds, and petals. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. Each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extend from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be of one piece with the center stem and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand and set them so they reflect their light forward. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to keep the lamps burning continually. This is the lampstand that stands in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation. Aaron and the priests must tend the lamps on the pure gold lampstand continually in the Lord's presence. So before Annie read, I mentioned how the pillar of fire and cloud showed all the people that God was with them and it giving them direction and protection. And now God was giving them a chance to create an object of beauty to end worship that would enable them to kind of reflect that awareness of his glory, like little flames answering that big pillar of flame. The large amount of gold, 75 pounds, was actually given by the people. Do you remember where they got all that gold? 
as they left Egypt, the people were just giving it to them, like saying, go, get out of our land, we're tired of all the plagues. So they had all this gold, and, um, and God had a purpose for it. And I find it am amazing that God um, entrusted that to them even before he revealed what the purpose was. They just needed to recognize that the gold wasn't for their own wealth or security. It was for giving back to God to accomplish his vision and provide for this treasure, which was an ongoing opportunity for worship. Artisans who were gifted with the help of the Holy Spirit carved a large menorah out of one piece of gold, according to these very specific directions. The base supported it, leaning up to a center stem that branched out and had ornate buds and petals. I believe it was crafted this way to reflect the tree of life. Do you remember how the tree of life is described? in the book of Genesis in the garden before the fall, and Adam and Eve had to leave the garden so they wouldn't eat from that um, tree and then live forever in this state of being sinful and not restored to God. But it appears again in the description of heaven in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. So in between the beginning of, and the end of human history as we know it, there stands a menorah of gold as a sign of God's promise to once again provide eternal life. And the blossoms on the tree are shaped like almond blossoms. Did that surprise you at all? That may not be the fruit you think about, but I think it connects with the story of Aaron's rod in number 17. At the time, there was a dispute about who should be the priest, who's going to be in charge. And um, God decided to make a way to show them what he would want. Aaron had been the likely candidate, but there was some dis disruption because he had made the mistake of giving into the people's wishes and creating that golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain. And maybe they thought he was unworthy to be their big, their high priest. But God showed that he had forgiven and chosen Aaron by causing his rod that was laid out, separated from any tree, to blossom and produce almonds. Wow. It was one of the, the artifacts that was put into the Ark of the Covenant. It was very meaningful to them. And since the priests tended the menorah, it would remain a testament, those little almond features of it, of God's forgiveness and gracious second chances. If we're honest, we need that message too, don't we? We all need more than one chance when it comes to knowing how to do God's will instead of just following our own instincts and ideas. I remember when our girls were little and we lived in Newport, I was really struggling with an important relationship in my life. And God gave me this picture and message. It was kind of related to Aaron's rod budding, even though it was only a stick. I envisioned my relationship with this person to be a tree that was dormant for the winter and it looks like it's dead with no leaves, no fruit, and the Holy Spirit gave me this assurance that it would bud and bloom again. And it was a message of hope that I really needed to give that relationship a second chance. And you know, all these years later, I can tell you the vision has come to fruition. That relationship is still strong and, and growing each year, which is a very joyful thing. And maybe the symbol of the almond buds and the menorah can bring hope to your heart or even joy, remembering how your relationship with God sprang to life again, maybe after a period of disconnection. Maybe it will help encourage you to have hope for a relationship in your life that just seems dormant and distant. And then in the text from Leviticus, we see that even though the priests tended the menorah, 
The people had an ongoing role. From every generation, they had the responsibility and opportunity of bringing pure oil from pressed olives for the light that kept those lamps burning continually. See, the original uh, menorah was not a candle holder. It was an oil lamp. And the oil called for came from unripe olives, so the, even before the first fruits. And they were crushed in a mortar. And then the, that pulpy olive um, mixture was placed in a cloth basket, and the oil dripped through. And then the oil that was produced was very pure and clear so that it burned with little or no smoke, which was important both symbolically for the purity and practically because this is inside a tent and you don't want a big smoky huge candelabra making it hard to breathe. The Lord's instruction was to keep these lamps burning continually. And that would require for at least one priest to be there at all times, even through the night. Maybe some of you feel like you've spent a lot of time at church lately. Can you imagine the attentiveness and dedication it took for the priest to follow this instruction? Some sources I read indicated that the priest might have just kept that center flame burning all the time and ready to light the other flames of the, on the branches whenever needed. And I think that that's a really good picture of Christ being the center flame, always, always reflecting God's glory. And we can come to him day or night, because Christ is always ready to kindle the glory of God in us, the source of our joy and our purpose. It allows us than to reflect God's glory back to him in worship, whether we're here in church singing and praying together, whether we're at home, maybe spending some quiet time with God, reading scriptures, or whether we're out in the community or in our homes or places of work, serving God through acts of care and creativity that the Spirit leads us to do throughout the whole week. That's how we let our light shine, just as Jesus asked us to in the Sermon on the Mount. So if you feel yourself coming under the dark cloud, it's time to light the, come to the light of life and ask him to rekindle the joy in your soul. He's always happy to do that. One of the ways that I've been doing that this um, Advent season is actually um, choosing a, a little devotional I read every morning and night. It's called A Joyful Christmas. And it came along with an ornament that said joy, so I put that in my home and, it, and a little blank book with just the word joy on the cover. Um, it helps me to be able to stop and notice the joyful things each day, and it really orients my heart towards, towards praising God for those things. In the introduction to the book, I read this. Many, for many, the holiday season is a time of both celebration and sorrow, laughter and loneliness. Whatever your highs and lows, spend time with Jesus, and the beginning and close of your day, listen to the very heart of God. And as you soak in God's presence, may you grow ever more confident of God's faithfulness to you. No matter the hardships you encounter, the scars you carry, the fears you face, you can rest assured that God is for you. Your Savior is quietly, humbly, yet miraculously working on your behalf, creating beauty out of ashes, hope out of sadness, new beginnings out of loss. And as he has since entering our world so long ago, offering you and all of us his overflowing forever joy. The miracles and the joy are here, even in the hard things. Two that I've written about in my little joy book I thought I might share with you this morning. Um, we prayed for travel mercies for Natalie going back to college, and God provided those, even though she did have a pretty severe car accident in the snowstorm. 
She was unhurt, as was the other driver, and people showed her kindness and gave her a place to be that night that was safe and warm. And one thing that really has just felt like a miracle is that we found a, a repair shop that was willing to take her car in and order all those parts and just work even round the clock to make her car ready for her again. The owner came in at one in the morning to paint it because the painter got sick with COVID. And wouldn't you agree that's a miracle? <laughs> so we just feel joy even in the, in, in the wake of an accident because we're focusing on how God is coming through for us. And the other is um, our wall. You might not think it's a miraculous wall, but it's a tricky wall. <laughs> and it, it, when we came in a bit earlier this week, even on Friday, there was a, a spot as big as my dining room table that was all green. <laughs> and everything was torn apart in here. And the reason it was like that is because there was a wetness to the wall. And we did not know if it was leaking, the roof was leaking again. And so my prayer was, God, can you please show us if the if the roof is leaking and we will just live with it that way and realize it's a kind of a reflection of what some of our lives are feeling like right now and then if if the roof is not leaking would you make it dry for our painter who's coming in in the morning to check and it was raining buckets wasn't it on saturday morning i consider that an answer to prayer because he came in and the wall was dry and I just feel that that is a Christmas miracle, too. Our wall is yet not perfect. Allah, life is not perfect. But it's getting better, and we can praise God for his willingness to show us the next step forward and giving us a good-hearted handyman. So I encourage you to look for the way God is working on your behalf in the midst of challenging things. And I am absolutely certain that you can find joy there too. You know, it was this very impulse to look for and recognize the miracle in the middle of hard things that led to the celebration of Hanukkah. The story begins with a devastating series of events more than 150 years before Jesus was born. At the time, Judea wasn't under Rome. It was under the control of Syria. And a leader named Antiochus IV outlawed their worship of, of Yahweh. Well, the Jews resisted giving up worshiping God in the temple. They didn't want to worship the Greek gods that Antiochus was trying to force on them. So he decided to come in a show of power, and he sent soldiers to Jerusalem, and they killed innocent people, and they desecrated the temple. They built an altar to Zeus in the temple, and they sacrificed pigs there. Well, this was just devastating for the folks, but it also kind of got their courage rolling. And um, the priests were actually the leaders in kind of pushing back. And it took a, a couple of years, but a Jewish priest named Judah Maccabee led a rebellion that was actually successful in regaining control of Jerusalem. And then they, um, he called on the people to cleanse the temple, to rebuild the altar to Yahweh, and to relight the menorah there. And they began that rededication ceremony, even though there was only enough untainted olive oil to keep the menorah's lamp burning one day. And yet, God miraculously kept those lights burning, flickering in the dark for eight days and nights, which gave them enough time to go through that procedure I described where they press the olives and make fresh olive oil. The joy in the hearts of the people inspired them to celebrate this miracle at, with an eight-day long festival every year, which is called Hanukkah. <laughs> and the menorah that the Jews used to celebrate Hanukkah, it actually looks a little bit different than the description that Annie read to us this morning. It has nine lamps or candles instead of seven. Did you wonder about that? 
This is because the Talmud prohibits the use of a seven lamp menorah outside of the temple. So they added a couple of extra ones. And did you ever notice there's one a bit higher in, in the middle? That one's called the helper candle, and that's the one that lights the rest. Menorahs are used both in Jewish and in Christian worship, and they're often found in Eastern Orthodox churches. I, I bought my first little menorah. You can see it kind of up on the front by the, the nativity scene. This just this Christmas and brought it, brought it here for you to see. It's much, much smaller than the original one that God described, and it's made out of brass instead of pure gold. But it's another opportunity for me to focus on tending the lights and focusing on God's joyful presence this Christmas. I'm wondering, how might God be inspiring you to tend the lights in your life? Might this morning be a chance for you to thank God and rejoice in a second chance he's given you to join him and fulfill his purpose for your life? Maybe the Holy Spirit is moving you to have hope for a relationship that seems dead, but with God's touch of life might bloom again. It could be that the busyness of Christmas has eclipsed your time with God and it, that keeps you centered and you just need to slow down and go to that center light and let him relight that flame of joy in your heart with some quiet time with him. Because you can always draw near to Jesus, the eternal flame, with confidence that he stands ready to share God's glory with you. And if you feel that you are in the middle of what seems like a tragedy or at least a very big mess, be assured that God's light is there too. God can keep that light flickering and burning as long as it's needed until you are ready to add the oil of your own gladness back into the lamp. So let's tend our lamps with hopeful anticipation of Jesus keeping his word coming again and setting all things right. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for inviting people to make the menorah. Thank you for um, how we can light small lights, both physically and in our soul, from the glory that you share with us, that we can reflect it back to you. So we ask, Lord, that you orient our hearts to you, that you fill us with your joy, even in the hard times. Help us to search for it and find it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. One, two, three, four. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us
benediction and you have a part in here so you might want to follow along it's the little bold lines there at the end of the story jesus said look i am coming soon bringing my reward with me i am the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end i jesus have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches I am both the source of David and heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. So we respond. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Amen.